No political issues stirred more heat and passion in the 2016 presidential race than border security and immigration. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. And Outrage over Trump's remarks was widespread, but Trump's promise to build a wall on the border and deport millions struck a chord. The Texas Tribune endeavored to get beyond the heated rhetoric, to understand why people and dope keep pouring across it, and to get to the bottom of what we in Texas and the United States are doing and what we're not doing to stop it. Our international journey begins where so many undocumented immigrants start theirs, Central America's Northern Triangle. Donald Trump's jabs at Mexico obscured an important new trend on the border. The number of Mexicans caught crossing it has steadily dropped, while apprehensions of Central Americans has skyrocketed. In El Salvador, the violent epicenter of the Northern Triangle, warring street gangs in 2015 gave the tiny country the dubious title of murder capital of the world. Many of the victims end up here in San Salvador's central morgue. We have seen a lot of decapitations. Sometimes they are stabbed a lot of times. They're hacking off their limbs, so it's a little bit of a slower death. Here, boxes of decades-old bones from El Mosote, site of the worst massacre in El Salvador's Civil War, sit on the shelves next to more recent victims of the gang wars. Forensic anthropologist Saul Quijada says it's almost like the Salvadoran Civil War, officially over as of 1992, never really ended. This is one of the gang war's youngest victims, still waiting to be claimed. Another victim, this one a teenager, was the relative of a government prosecutor. The machete go went this way. So they cut the head yeah. off or what? No, completely, but they did try. Those same brutal tactics have been used by Salvadoran gang members based in the U.S., and authorities say some of them have crossed our border along the same routes as migrants fleeing their crime-ridden homeland. Here in El Salvador, the authorities have been trying all sorts of strategies to stop the violence that is causing so many to seek refuge in the U.S. Now they've sent out a thousand police and army soldiers into the worst areas to quell the violence. We live in a situation where the violence and the delinquency have reached levels of importance, but it didn't happen from one day to the other. While we were talking to Chief Cotto, he got an urgent call and had to briefly stop our interview. Viene, son herencias de la guerra. Me permiten un momento solo. It was yet another report of MS-13 gang members getting shot by police amid El Salvador's ongoing crackdown. Han resultado prácticamente cuatro delincuentes terroristas fallecidos. Es decir, hemos encontrado una UCI, dos pistolas y un revólver. Getting out of Central America into Mexico is deceptively easy. If you think we have a porous border in Texas, take a look at the southern Mexican state of Chiapas, at the spot where the Suchiate River divides Mexico and Guatemala. It's wide open for business down here. All kinds of goods and all kinds of people are crossing here in plain sight of the official entry point. Many are tourists and day laborers. Some are migrants. Nobody stops them. La mayoría van rumbo a Tijuana, Texas, todos esos lugares donde se van infiltrando. We met Eric Alexander Reyes right after he waded over from Guatemala. Ellos están haciendo de todo, matando mujeres, niños, embarazadas, violando. Está bien feo la situación allá en mi país. Like most who cross here, Reyes was headed to Tapachula, 
about 30 miles away. The journey there is filled with police checkpoints. Migrants who can afford a smuggler can bribe their way through. The rest of them do their best not to get caught. Voy rodeando las casetas todo. No me meto mucho ves porque si te metes mucho hacia el monte están los ladrones. Once they get to Tapachula, a lot of them end up here. See, uh, this is the albergue called Belén. Uh -huh. This is a casa de inmigrantes. Over here we have a, a place to stay for three days. I could be able to be clean over here, you know, uh -huh. to wash my clothes and to have something to eat. Migrants used to leave here for Arriaga to hop a ride on the train known as the Beast. But in 2014, Mexico launched its southern border plan. Now, instead of riding the train, they're walking and enduring abuse and shakedowns every step of the way. To accommodate all of the diverted foot traffic, they're building a new shelter in nearby Chahuites. The shelter director says he's been deluged with worn out travelers, many of them whole families or children traveling alone. Hay compañeros que llegan con los pies destrozados porque caminar desde Tapachula hasta aquí bastante, caminan a veces hasta más de una semana. Estamos recibiendo, imagínate, 120 personas diarias. One of the last stops in Mexico's deep south is Ixtepec, Oaxaca, a launching pad for migrants heading toward the United States. Alberto Donis runs the shelter here. He says the crackdown by Mexican authorities has done nothing but increase the misery of the migrants. Y desde que entra el programa La Frontera Sur, pues ya todo el mundo llega asaltado. Todo el mundo, todo el mundo. This man says he was robbed twice, including by federal police. Vieron el dinero y nos dijeron que si no les dábamos el dinero, que nos iban a entregar a migración. Honduran immigrant Dikeni Carias, his pregnant wife, and their two-year-old son arrived here exhausted and penniless. Al otro lado del río, pues ahí nos asaltaron, nos quitaron todo nuestro, lo que traíamos. Gracias a Dios que no hicieron nada ni a mi esposa ni a mi niño. Not all of them will reach the U.S., but even when they end up getting stopped in Mexico and sent back home, it's just another obstacle to overcome on the long road north. I am an immigrant and I ask for forgiveness. We don't want to do this, but we found ourselves in a place where uh, we had to decide to die or to leave. I decided to leave. For Central Americans who can't afford a smuggler, getting to the United States border is no walk in the park. Remember Honduran migrant Dikeni Carias? He and his wife Karina had another baby in Mexico City, uh -huh. then slowly made their way toward Piedras Negras, right across the Rio Grande from Eagle Pass, Texas. But they quickly found out that Central Americans are second-class citizens in Mexico. They got kicked out of this motel in the middle of the night just because of their nationality. Okay, él no, porque no, es por centroamericano. Sí, por el, el hecho de que pues, como tú sabes que por la migración y todo que están viniendo. We'll tell you more about what happened to Dikeni and his family later, but first we're going to take you to our side of the border, where hope begins and ends for so many. The U.S.-Mexico border can be chaotic and heartbreaking. That's particularly true in Texas, which has far more borderland than any other state. In the spring of 2016, we visited the southern tip of Texas, the Rio Grande Valley, where there are more people apprehended and more pounds of dope seized than in any other stretch of the Texas-Mexico border. In Starr County, in a town called Roma, we found what looked and felt like a smuggler's paradise. There are no man-made physical barriers to speak of here, no big walls or fences. There are plenty of river islands to stash humans and drugs. Plus, they don't keep boats in the water around the clock here. And just like they told us, once those Border Patrol boats come off the river, the cat and mouse game begins. All you have to do is listen to their radios. Four bodies running north on the uh, west side of the road. Yeah, there might be a lot of church. Our chief guide was Border Patrol agent Jose Perales. He's a 16-year veteran of the agency, a lifer. 
You know that he sort of lives to show the outside world what's happening down here, and you know why he picked Roma, Texas to do the showing. The river is very close to Roma. So they can actually just run like two blocks and they're on 83. We have a lot of traffic that runs into the Dollar General. See where the brush starts right there? That's the drop down to the river. And how long will it take you to run from there to those stores and get lost in the, in the public? So it's maybe, what, 10, 15 second run to the top? You come out here and you end up in vehicle pursuits. And there's days that you get assaulted, you get into fights. You go and you're chasing people, you're running, you trip over, you can easily fall. This is the area that they work, and they know this area very well, you know. A lot of times these people have been in stash houses on the south side for days, so hence they haven't taken a shower, you know, for days. So you can actually smell them. Hey, no one has been like this. Hey, ve, agárrala. Hey, agárrala, señora. For the people who live along the river's edge in Roma, dealing with the constant flow of undocumented immigrants has become a way of life. Five minutes ago, before you got here, there was two running over there straight to the store. Activity everywhere. Roma sits right across the river from Ciudad Miguel Aleman, where in recent years, two rival mafias, the Gulf Cartel and the Setas, have fought pitched battles for control of this lucrative smuggling corridor. This is the other half of that smuggling paradise we found in Roma. Only paradise isn't a word you find yourself using in the same sentence with Miguel Aleman. You can still see the scars of cartel warfare, which can flare at any moment. And locals say the real bosses in Miguel Aleman are the drug lords, not the government. Only a river divides us from Miguel Aleman, but Roma might as well be on a different planet. It's easy to fear the border, but then you run across all these kids, kids traveling alone, kids fleeing lives of desperation, kids who are coming here to join their undocumented parents, that's where the big numbers are down here. It's the kids and the family units, as they're called. And they don't run, they turn themselves in. They cross them, yeah. and then they tell them, okay, just follow the road all the way to the top. So here comes the family unit, just walking the road. It's mainly gangs that they're fleeing from. So I get why they're leaving. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, we still have a job to do, you know, and all of them can apply for asylum. It'll be up to, to the immigration judge to decide you know, their fate. We met a 14-year-old Guatemalan girl who was headed to Houston. She traveled here with her brother and cousin. They were forced to cross the river alone when their smuggler abandoned them on the Mexican side. Ir a estudiar, ir a ver a mis papás. ¿Sabes lo que quieres estudiar un día? Quiero ser doctora. This is the old estate home. My grandma used to live there. And Ruperto Escobar has been ranching along the Rio Grande his whole life, just like his parents and their ancestors, all the way back to the mid-1700s. Smugglers have used his land for years to move people and product. He doesn't see that changing anytime soon. It's mainly the disturbances at night, early hours in the morning. That's when they, when they do their stuff. Waking you up because you hear the sounds or the dogs are constantly barking. So you get up to see what's going on, you know. I stopped fixing gates. So the main gates as you come in, I don't close them. What for? They ram into them. So what do you do? Do I run to the police and tell them, hey, go catch them, they're there. Then what happens? What do you think will happen next? They're gonna know who did it. I wouldn't put it past them to go and, and, and do some harm to me the following day or, or next week or the following week. So we just, you know what, let them be. We had to briefly stop the interview with him while two coyotes, slang for smugglers, moved a load of undocumented Mexican workers over his ranch. Mira, see that? No, 
no somos policía. Ah, no. ah bueno. Gracias. Son, report, son reporteros nomás, pero no son policía. No, que no tomen video, ahí les encargo. You just have to swallow your pride, sort of. And, and say, okay, well, you know what? Uh, just don't bother us, and we'll leave you alone. Because at that moment, they're going to come and catch them. But then I have to live here the rest of my life, like my ancestors lived here all their life. Police is not going to come and stay with me and, and, and take care of me. And it's not just me. I mean, it happens to all of us up and down the border here. It sounds not too brave, but what do you do? You, you got to survive. Donald Trump is not the only politician who rose to power promising to fix our poorest southern border. In Texas, Republican leaders took the unprecedented step of creating a state-run border patrol apparatus. Boats, cameras, boots on the ground, all at a cost of nearly half a billion dollars a year. It's been good politics for a lot of people, but there's no evidence it's worked. This border surge has truly become a border splurge over the past decade. There were more people caught sneaking across the border after they started spending all that money than before. And there's no indication that the border buildup has cut the supply of illegal drugs in the U.S., which has only 5% of the world's population, but consumes 80% of the world's supply of opioids. It became harder to get the pills and the heroin, so I switched over to that. There's a lot of dealers, I mean, all over the place. <laughs> the big problem with our border security strategy? We're focusing most of our money and nearly all of our attention on reducing the supply. It looks impressive when we have the DEA and the ATF and the FBI down at the border having a big press conference with stacks and stacks of drugs and weapons. And you think, wow, this thing is over. Until you realize this is like an hour's worth of work by the cartels. This is nothing. If we have a drug problem in this country, it's not because we have too many drugs, it's because we have too many people who want to take drugs. Americans are not only buying drugs that flow over the U.S.-Mexico border, our employers hire the workers who cross it, and the government basically looks the other way. And I will not sleep at night knowing that some employer in this state, because we refuse to act, is allowed to treat someone like a slave in the year 2009 in the United States of America. That's Dan Patrick, a former talk radio show host and Donald Trump's top Texas ally. He rode to the powerful office of Texas Lieutenant Governor by promising to secure the border at last. But nearly eight years after Patrick made those remarks, immigrants say they're still working like modern day slaves in a Texas workplace with little regulatory oversight. Every day we have a job. They never ask for the documents, nothing like that but uh, they know. Guatemala native Jose Sick made less than $3 an hour bussing tables when he first came to Houston as an undocumented immigrant in the late 1990s. When I asked for my first race, the owner told me, okay, you're not working anymore. Hay infinidad de empleos que que otras personas que realmente tienen todo legal no no les gusta hacerlo. After being forced to work 70 hours a week with no overtime, Mexican immigrant Jesus Enrique Muñoz turned to the Equal Justice Center in Austin for help. It stimulates a race to the bottom where some employers, the unscrupulous employers, prefer to hire those workers precisely because they're exploitable. Beardall sued and forced Munoz's employer to pay him back wages. He's done the same for Mexican janitors at Target, immigrant food workers at HEB Grocery, and countless undocumented construction workers. He never runs out of lawsuits to file. Jose Manuel Santoyo has done his share of work in the vast shadows of the underground economy. It started when he was just a kid growing up in rural Corsicana, Texas. Corsicana has a big undocumented population at the moment, and People, people know where to go apply for a job here. A few years ago, a friend recommended he apply at the Collins Street Bakery, a famous local company that sells fruitcakes around the world. He told me, you know what, like, they'll hire anybody. Santoyo's experience at Collins Street spilled into the newspapers last year when a bakery vice president ran for a seat in the Texas legislature. Thomas McNutt's top issue, border security 
and illegal immigration. Santoyo didn't like being in the crosshairs of McNutt's angry rhetoric, so he went public with his tale of working at the bakery. It landed like a bombshell in the race. Illegal immigrants. That's what Texans call them. Thomas McNutt calls them employees. He says he's for border security, but his bakery... I thought it was very hypocritical because obviously his family, they build their wealth on the backs of undocumented cheap labor. Decorate the tops of the cakes. Bob McNutt, Thomas McNutt's uncle, is the president of Collins Street Bakery, founded in 1896. And all of a sudden our name was being drug through the mud as though we had somehow participated in something and knowingly hired a person who was not eligible, and that's simply not the case. Hiring undocumented immigrants has been illegal ever since President Ronald Reagan gave amnesty to almost three million people in 1986. But there's no extreme vetting required in the workplace. There's hardly any vetting at all. For seven or eight hundred dollars, somebody can go buy a set of false documents. The employer looks at it, often willfully, with a wink, saying, well, it looks reasonably genuine on, on its face. Fine. For the record, so, Bob McNutt said Collins Street Bakery didn't know Santoyo amount, was in the country illegally. We have no desire to hire someone outside the law. It's simply not worth our time, effort, and risk. Santoyo wouldn't discuss what, if any, documents he used to get hired at Collins Street or anywhere else. Beyond the details of this particular case, here's the fundamental truth about our don't ask, don't tell system. No matter how many hurdles we erect at the border, once immigrants get past them, they find plentiful jobs. Putting in brick, installing wiring, plumbing. Out here in eastern Travis County, Texas, if you want a job, it's not hard to find one. You can only do so much at that border. You can never have enough enforcement personnel to deal with this as long as the, that magnet or that attraction is still there. If most immigrants come here to work, then surely in the red state of Texas, our conservative leaders are doing everything in their power to stop employers from hiring them, right? I'd like to know what the state is doing to reduce the unquenchable demand for undocumented labor. They were talking about a bill that would require state contractors to use E-Verify, e an electronic system to vet the legal status of their employees. There are jobs that can be undertaken uh, by non-citizens as well with, with relatively little uh, repercussion on that individual or, or the employer. That's the bill's author. I asked him why the most conservative Texas legislature in modern times has not made E-Verify mandatory in the private sector where nearly all of the undocumented immigrants work. If we can get something done without putting a heavier hand on business, I, that's kind of the best way to handle it. Governor Greg Abbott and Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick both declined our offer to explain their views on camera. But here's what we learned off camera. They'll talk your ear off about their support for spending billions on a state-run border patrol. But when it comes to policing immigrants in the workplace, they say that's a job for the feds. They understand that their, their business supporters don't want E-Verify because it undermines their bottom line when they get so much benefit from having undocumented immigrants. So what now? Where do we go from here? Well, maybe we should look beyond the wall and into a mirror. Maybe we should look at our own role in creating this mess. We have in this country an insatiable demand for drugs. If we can begin to reduce demand in this country, then supply will not be that much of an issue. There's no such thing as work federal enforcement. It's a shame. I mean, you've got to have the border, and you have to have that interior enforcement. There's got to be consequences. People of all persuasions have been moving back and forth across the Rio Grande River for hundreds of years. You know, how do you stem that tide? You can't take a big part of our workforce and just whoosh them away. And what if we started helping our neighbors help themselves instead of blaming them for all of our problems? If you create a job over there, then it's uh, less of a reason why people come over here. It is to our best interest to work with those countries, especially our neighbors uh, to the south. Cuando inviertes en la gente, cuando inviertes en oportunidades de trabajo. Si no empiezas hoy, nunca vas a tener un resultado. Y entonces ahí sí este país va a ser inviable. 
The stakes are high no matter what we do, and a lot of lives are hanging in the balance. Trump could take away Jose Manuel Santoyo's temporary legal status, his DACA papers, with the stroke of a pen. I mean, the United States is my home. This is where I grew up. This is where I want to be. This is where I want to build a career. So, yeah, like losing DACA would definitely be devastating. For Dikeni Carias and his family, the dream of a better life seems more elusive than ever. All those friends and family members who promised for months to help him when he finally got to the border, they pulled out one by one when he actually arrived in Piedras Negras. That was right before Christmas last year. We haven't seen them since, and their cell phones have been disconnected. Jose Sick tries not to think about what would happen if he gets deported, to his Texas-born kids, to the Houston soccer field he built, and to the only world he's known for more than half of his life. When I play, I forget everything. I forget about my kids, my wife, bills, insurance, about Trump, <laughs> about, I'm sorry, I, for, I mentioned that. Most of us, we come to work to give our best, to respect others. I would just say, please give us the opportunity to be someone, to be a person.